Thanks so much. Thanks for the opportunity to, to speak here. And I'm kind of, maybe I'll just try clicking forward and see what happens. Oh, that's a pretty good sign. Okay, right on. So uh, my job here is actually a pretty fun one. I'm meant to educate you in, in 10 minutes on stem cells. So we'll see how we go. Uh, so on our crash course, we're gonna talk both about pluripotent stem cells and adult stem cells. I'll try to give you examples of each. Uh, explain the theoretical applications and their limitations. So um, <coughs> embryonic stem cells are the are pluripotent stem cells, and they're probably the ones that have received the most media hype, probably the ones you're most familiar with. But these are not a totipotent stem cell. Only a fertilized egg is a totipotent stem cell, and only a fertilized egg can make a whole human being. But we can take these fertilized eggs, and we can let the cells develop for a few days, and um, you can see the green inner cell mass that forms inside a blastocyst. So this is a few days after fertilization. And we can take those green cells and we can pull them out of the inner cell mass and we can grow them in culture. And that is an embryonic stem cell culture. So these are actually uh, extremely remarkable cells. And they are legitimately pluripotent, as in they can become any tissue in the body. So we can take these green cells and we can put them inside a blastocyst from uh, a black, or in this example, a purple mouse, and we can transfer them like this. And when the mouse, uh, we can implant then the blastocyst back into the uh, uterus of a mouse, and we can make what's called a chimeric animal. And in this case, the green cells have contributed to all the tissues in the mouse, all the tissues. So you can imagine I'm sure instantly what the regenerative implications of this are, right? We can make any tissue with those green cells. We just need to figure out how. So the theoretical uh, applications of pluripotent stem cells are huge, but there are, are some really simple and probably obvious problems. The first and most obvious problem is that the fertilized egg that we might use to form the embryo of the blastocyst is not you, right? So it's the same as uh, assuming that my kidney would be compatible in you. That's probably not a very good assumption. So if we just use embryonic stem cells in general without them being specifically matched, it's likely that your immune system would reject these cells or tissues that we form. But there has been uh, some serious innovation in this area in the last couple decades. And the most significant is probably by Shinya Yamanaka. So in 2006, he published a paper that described how to make embryonic-like stem cells from skin cells, and he did this with a, with a mouse. And so now that we can make you stem cells, if you like, you can imagine a scenario where we could take a skin cell from you, we could take it into culture, and we could grow it into an embryonic-like stem cell, and then we could subsequently differentiate it into a heart cell or a neural cell, and then we could use that to specifically repair tissue in you. So this is, this is a major innovation, and in 2012, Yamanaka received the Nobel Prize for this. Yes, but uh, you know, we want to be a little bit realistic. We don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, so the, the major challenge that remains unmet, uh, this is my opinion, is that um, actually mimicking the developmental process has turned out to be much more difficult than we thought. So uh, the, the normal processes that happen with a fertilized egg and, and uh, through fetal development are, are really absolutely extraordinary. And mimicking these in a tissue culture plate has turned out to be very, very challenging. So it's important here from an innovation, but a practical perspective for us to understand that we're not really ready yet for most IPS-based therapies. We're just not there yet. But these cells are incredibly powerful tools. They offer great models for studying the developmental process. And um, one of the very, I think, cool and promising things is that we can start to develop personalized medicine models. So we can take a cell from you if you have some sort of disease pathology. We can turn it into an embryonic-like stem cell. And then we can map its behavior during differentiation. And this seems to be uh, a promising tool then to subsequently make heart or neural cells 
that probably very much mimic your phenotype and would make a great platform for testing drugs that might affect your uh, heart or nerv nervous system function. So uh, the next thing that we want to talk about are adult stem cells. And I think that the, uh, my two colleagues here will mostly only be commenting on adult stem cells and adult stem cell-based therapies. So adult stem cells are cells that are found throughout your body and they're essentially tissue reserves. And your tissues, a lot of them are probably repairing themselves on a much more rapid uh, timeline or time frame than you actually appreciate. So uh, probably the most well understood adult stem cells, the hematopoietic stem cell, and that lives in your bone marrow and it's replenishing your blood constantly, probably at a rate that you don't appreciate, uh, around 400 billion new cells every day. Um, and your skin is also repairing itself at a similar rate, and so is the lining of your gut. And so you can imagine if these processes are happening naturally, <laughs> it's pretty obvious for scientists and clinicians and, and anybody who's aware of it to think, well, if we could just upregulate or we, if we could just control these processes, the regenerative potential would be huge. So um, most adult stem cell uh, based therapies are based on that pr this premise. And I think uh, what is more maybe inspiring or hopeful is that adult stem cell based therapies are actually already in the clinic and we are already making a difference. So the, uh, I, I really think the whole field really rests on uh, our great work in hematopoietic stem cell transplantation. So the first transplant uh, was in 1968, so around 50 years ago. And this is now a routine procedure used to treat patients with bone marrow cancers or immune deficiencies. So we can now recover hematopoietic stem cells. So in the adult, and I'm pointing to myself like I'm an adult, um, in an adult, in an adult, uh, your hematopoietic stem cells reside in your bone marrow. And we used to only do bone marrow transplants, but now we have a little trick that uh, coaxes your hematopoietic stem cells out of your bone and then we're able to collect them from your peripheral blood and use those in transplant applications. And of course, you probably, most, most of you will be familiar with the storage of umbilical cord blood, and that's primarily because it contains hematopoietic stem cells and can be used in this transplant application. We're getting really good at this. This is a curative therapy that is um, used routinely, and, and actually I think uh, maybe you'll comment on this, um, my colleagues. Supervisor at University of Sydney is a hematologist who performs this on a regular basis. But as a community now, we've hit over 50,000. So there's been over 50,000 uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplants, and this really does form, I think, the basis for the next generation of adult stem cell therapies. And I, but I do want to make the point that it is the only routine stem cell transplant. So the, the stem cell population that my colleagues will, uh, I think, focus on today is mesochymal stem cells. And these, one, these cells uh, also live in your connective tissue throughout your body so we can harvest them from a number of tissues. Um, and I think probably the most obvious application is in the repair of bone or cartilage. But uh, the applications do go far beyond that. And in the very first uh, presentation, there was a comment about there being 200 uh, stem cell transplants. Actually, uh, this, is a, this is a moving target. There were around 200, I have a, another slide that I'll show you later. It's from a 2012 paper, and there were 115 from memory mesochymal stem cell trials listed on clinicaltrials.gov, and that was in 2012. Now there's around 400, 450. So this is an area that's exploding, and people are using mesochymal stem cells in, in a trial scenario to repair bone, cartilage, cardiac, uh, and treat graft versus host disease, and many, many other applications. But it's really important. One of the things we want to get ac across today is that most of these trials are regulated, and most of them are using expanded cells and huge numbers of expanded cells. So, and there's also very few products yet, so it's early days. So what should you be aware of? <laughs> uh, I think the, the biggest thing is, and actually Mark, over, Mark uh, a friend and colleague here, 
ask me over coffee, how many stem cells are there in a fat aspirate? Well, there's just not very many stem cells in any tissue. Stem cells are rare. And so if somebody tells you there's lots of stem cells, to me, that's, that's a warning sign right there. So in hematopoietic stem cell and MSC-based therapies, where we do have clinical efficacy in the few examples where we can demonstrate this, we know that cell number and cell quality matters. So more is almost always better. And the other thing you probably want to understand is that there's no stem cell panacea, or we haven't identified it yet. So if anybody suggests that there is, I'd be a little bit wary. But don't, don't be worried. Uh, the field is progressing. And at the end, I'll go through some of the, uh, what I think are promising opportunities. But I think, oh, do I have one more slide? Um, I, I did want to make this one last comment, but it'll be expanded on heavily here. The threats to medical uh, and clinical translation, I think, really are hype. We have to be careful and we have to be responsible as scientists and clinicians. We need to be honest and realistic with the public. And uh, if anybody is interested and it looked like there might be, um, I, I can refer you to the industry guidelines. So it's the US International Society for Stem Cell Research. And I think as an intelli uh, intelligent community, we can provide you with some guidelines. And uh, you know, it, it really was interesting to hear the previous talks. I think we need to uh, encourage innovation, but we probably need some regulatory oversight. And we need to be a little bit careful with this. And I think that that's my last slide. And so I'll hand it over. All right, well, while that's going, my name's Alison. Sorry, I'm much shorter than Mike. Thank you. Um, all right. Um, just going to wait. Oh, success. Um, so my name's Alison. Um, I'm going to be talking about autologous somatic cellular therapies in Australia. So first I'm going to describe the private stem cell industry that's operating in Australia. I'm going to discuss the regulatory context in which these private stem cell clinics operate. I'm then going to briefly overview some problems with these private stem cell clinics and some potential solutions. Okay, so we've identified at least 17 private stem cell clinics operating across Australia, but there's likely to be many more operating outside of clinics and physicians oper operating privately. And of these 17 clinics, at least 14 of these clinics mainly treat osteoarthritis with stem cell therapies. However, they do offer these stem cell therapies for a wide range of diseases. Now, what the therapies that they offer are is they offer an autologous somatic cellular therapy. And what that means is they'll do a small liposuction procedure where they'll um, harvest some fat cells, they'll then spin them down and um, extract the stem cells from those fat cells and then they will inject these cells back into the same patient which means it's an aut autologous therapy and that's for osteoarthritis into the joint. Um, and these clinics offer these stem cell therapies for a wide range of diseases from stroke to asthma and to autism, and they tend to target chronic diseases for which there may be limited evidence-based therapy available. There are also three cosmetic clinics that offer stem cell therapy for cosmetic purposes, and also three companies that market and sell stem cell therapies uh, to these stem cell clinics and also to practitioners. Okay, so these um, stem cell um, clinics have very sophisticated websites that, that allow them to market stem cell therapies directly to health consumers. And here are an example of a few of the websites. And as you can see, they're very well polished and they're very um, interactive and um, sophisticated with a lot of information. Um, and as you can see, they often reference um, media appearances where the um, practitioners of the clinic appear on current affairs shows along with patients, and they both describe the success of stem cell therapies. 
Okay, so the problem with these clinics is that they make unsupported claims on their websites regarding their efficacy of stem cell treatments. They use patient testimonial to market and sell stem cell therapy directly to the health consumer. They do not participate in research or produce any publications. They charge substantial fees for their treatment and there's no mechanism for reporting adverse effects of stem cell therapy. And I'll talk about these each in turn. So some of the claims made by these clinics um, that over 85% of patients treated show a significant improvement of between 50 to 100% in pain and mobility of the joint. And this claim appears repeatedly on a number of clinics' websites and it's not substantiated in evidence-based peer-reviewed literature. Another claim is that stromal therapy Stromal cell therapy is known to be a reliable treatment when it comes to joint problems and arthritis. And this is a very difficult claim to substantiate, especially since there are only phase one trials looking at the use of stem cell therapy in osteoarthritis. So we've only got to the point where we're testing safety of these treatments. So it's an interesting claim to make. And the last is stem cell therapy can slow down the aging process. Again, um, a very uh, vague claim about stem cell therapy. So these clinics rely heavily on patient testimonial um, on their websites. Um, so they use patient testimonial in the television segments that they appear in, um, where patients appear and they describe their success story. They use celebrity patients um, on these television shows. So the late Charlotte Dawson was on one television show and a former cricketer, um, Jeff Lawson. They also use um, sporting players who... Um, publish in newspapers about how stem cell therapy saved their careers and saved them from retirement. And they also have patient testimonial on their website and on their social media pages. So here is a Facebook page of one of the clinics, and sorry, the clinic name has been redacted, um, that you can see two patient re reviews giving the clinic five out of five stars for their stem cell therapy. Okay, so the cost of stem cell therapy is upwards from $9,000 per injection. You can pay $2,500 for storage of your stem cells, and you can go into up to $70,000 of payment plan to be repaid over 84 months, and the clinic will facilitate um, credit provided to you by a third party. Um, so I just want to talk a bit about the regulatory context in which these stem cell clinics are operating. So as you know, in Australia, we have the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which um, regulates medications and medical devices. And under the TGA sits the biologicals framework, which was implemented to regulate human tissues and cell products. So ordinarily, you would think autologous cellular therapies would sit under the biologicals framework. However, in 2011, there was an excluded goods order that was passed. And under item 4Q, it says any human tissue and cell product that is autologous, collected under the clinical care and treatment of a registered medical practitioner, manufactured by that medical practitioner, and used in a single treatment or a course of treatment for a single disease is not a therapeutic good and is not regulated by the TGA. So this means that these private stem cell clinics and autologous stem cell therapies are then left to the same mechanisms that regulate ordinary cl clinical practice. So these include the Health Practitioner National Law Act and, um, and professional misconduct and unsatisfactory professional conduct, complaints mechanisms such as APRA, uh, professional standards and codes of conduct put out by the Medical Board of Australia, uh, professional liability in negligence and the possibility of consumer law complaints to the ACCC for deceptive, deceptive and misleading conduct. As well, there's also advertising standards. So APRA has a, um, a set of advertising standards it puts out for regulation of a health service. And every time these practitioners appear in a media report or um, make a statement on their website, that constitutes an advertisement for the purpose of these standards. And what these standards say is that a personal business must not advertise in a way that's false, misleading or deceptive, uses testimonials, creates an unreasonable expectation of beneficial treatment and uses scientific information in av um, that should be from a reputable peer-reviewed source. However, the information that they provide, for example, 85% of patients show improvement in joint, in joint pain and mobility, um, isn't substantiated in peer-reviewed literature. It creates an unreasonable expectation of beneficial treatment because it states such a high rate of efficacy and it therefore is quite misleading. And as, as we've also said, they um, rely heavily on patient testimonial. 
Um, so then there could be a question of, are these stem cell clinics providing unproven therapies as research or innovation? And I don't think they're providing these therapies as either. So the reason why these um, stem cell clinics aren't providing these therapies as research is there's no identifiable research question or hypothesis being tested. They're not committed to the creation of generalizable knowledge and the dissemination of this knowledge through peer-reviewed publication. There's no evidence of ethics approval for re the research in humans, and there's no evidence of clinical trials being registered on the Australian and New Zealand um, trials registry. As well, these clinics aren't providing innovative therapies either. Innovative therapies are usually provided to a very small number of patients in a very um, tailor and the treatment is tailored to each specific patient. Whereas these websites state repeatedly that they treat hundreds of patients and they use the same treatment for hundreds of patients. And as well, innovative treatments are generally provided by specialists in that field. For example, an innovative cancer treatment would be provided by an oncologist, whereas the clinicians in these clinics are cosmetic surgeons that are treating um, osteoarthritis. And the specialists that would usually treat these diseases are rheumatologists or orthopedic surgeons. And as well, for research in innovative therapies, you wouldn't expect a patient to pay $9,000 for these treatments. So some potential issues with these stem cell clinics for the patients is that patients may be exposed to unknown risks. We do not know what the long-term effects of these stem cell therapy treatments are. It may delay patients in seeking proven beneficial treatments because they go down the route of stem cell therapy before. Uh, they may be excluded from clinical trials in the future because, again, we don't know what the long-term effect of these stem cell therapies are. It may create a situation where patients travel from overseas to Australia to receive these stem cell therapies in a kind of reverse stem cell tourism. And also these patients are vulnerable to financial exploitation. They can go up to tens of thousand dollars in debt to receive these stem cell therapies. And they are vulnerable patients because they're suffering from chronic diseases. As well, it may undermine the integrity of the medical profession where practitioners are allowed to continue to practice um, in apparent um, contravention of codes of conduct and professional standards. It has the potential to discredit the legitimate translation of stem cell research into clinical practice. And the regulatory mechanisms that are supposed to be regulating this field appear to be ineffectual. So some potential solutions um, include using the current existing biologicals framework and bringing autologous stem cell therapy under this framework. So in January of this year, the TGA um, released a consultation paper which looked at five different options for bringing autologous stem cell therapy into um, un regulation for, uh, under the biologicals framework. Um, and... Um, and another um, potential solution is also um, ongoing education of health practitioners to help them um, have frank conversations with their uh, patients about stem cell therapy. However, as you don't need a referral from a general practitioner to receive stem cell therapy, it's unlikely that that would actually achieve uh, its aim. There's also the possibility of education of health consumers um, to empower them to make informed treatment decisions. Um, or establishing a register of innovative stem cell therapies, uh, similar to what is done by the College of Surgeons for their innovative um, surgical therapies register. And then there's also the possibility of voluntary self-regulation where these uh, practitioners submit to their own code of conduct. But given the lucrative nature of stem cell therapy, it's unlikely or unclear whether that would be um, a feasible solution. Thank you. I think I'm the in-between height, so can you hear me all okay? Can everyone hear me? Excellent. Normally when I follow up at the end of a session, there has been alcohol involved, so I'm very pleased that you're all sober. <laughs> or should I be pleased? <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't be pleased. Um, it usually makes it much more interesting if you're half sloshed, but that's all right. Uh, so Mike has actually covered a lot of the science today as, as briefly as he could, as simply as he could. And I was thinking of Homer, Homer's brain, and I thought definitely at the end of the day, I'm more like the, the image on the left. I think he had a very small brain at that point. Uh, and then Alison covered um, some of the things that are happening within the, the non-regulated stem cell industry, particularly those types of things that are happening away from the hospital and institutional setting. I'm sure Mike would agree that all of his work is very highly regulated, would you say, Mike? Most of ours is restricted to the laboratory and we're trying to do some work with Mark Young 
And it will be very highly regulated. That's right. So there's a real difference between what happens within an institution and a hospital and what happens out there. And I often think of the Essendon Football Club and the things that have happened at Essendon that because they're not, they weren't conducted within a hospital or within, within a research institute, um, some things were done that you would not be able to get away with if you're in a hospital setting. So that's quite, that's just my opinion, um, but that's sort of quite interesting. What I'm going to do today, I'm just going to briefly cover, we talked about things like early phase research and it occurred to me that you might actually not be aware of what that was. Um, I'm also going to talk about an example of early phase research when it does go wrong. I'm not going to get into the whole science because it's way too late in the day. Um, so it's a little bit too, too difficult to comprehend, so I take it to an extra level um, and talk about gene therapies. And then I'm just going to discuss some of the, the litigation that's happening in the United States um, and some of the directions and some of the actions that have been taken there. All right, so let's move on to some basics. So the type of research that we've been talking about today is typically considered as early phase research. Now, this type of research is classed as phase zero to phase one. Here you're doing things like testing for safety and toxicity. So it's not about testing for benefit or efficacy. Um, so when patients enrol in these types of studies, they should know that what they're enrolling in is not likely to benefit them at all. So the, the main types of research conducted in this field are oncology studies. So they take up about 61% of all, all early phase research. And it includes things like first in human studies, first in child, uh, first time in a new population. Um, yes. So early phase research is very different and so is all research from typical clinical care and it's also different from innovative medical practice. So clinical care is normally focused on, uh, it's very patient focused, so you're looking at uh, prescribing treatments that are in the best interest of the patient. The same thing happens with innovative medical practice. Now in Australia there is a lot of innovative medical practice um, and I was thinking of, of the, you know, the Saatchi reform. So particularly within paediatrics in Australia, because there is a lot, a lot of a lack of evidence for best clinical guidelines, a lot of our paediatricians actually practice innovative medicine on a daily basis. So here what they'll do is they'll look at something that they think has worked in another patient and then they'll try it in a patient. Again there it's different from research because they're making decisions that they think are in the best interest of a patient. This is very different from clinical research. So clinical research is focused on producing generalisable knowledge. So you're not actually focused on benefiting um, the participants at all. And the intention is always future directed. Now the problem with um, benefits from research, so we know a lot of patients will actually enrol in particularly early phase studies, typically these types of patients, and it could be children being enrolled on their parents' behalf, um, are actually seeking another form of treatment. So usually these children or adults would have some sort of terminal illness and they've sort of exhausted all um, treatment uh, options that they have. Or it could be that they have a condition for which there is no cure. It could be something quite simple, sort of um, arthritis. Um, now one of the problems with uh, participants enrolling in these types of studies is when researchers are putting together a list of risks and benefits for the participants, much of the, many of the outcomes of previous studies aren't available. So with early phase research, so stem cell research, gene therapies, etc., only around 38% or less of all outcomes are ever published. So imagine if you're trying to do a law review and you're trying to find out about cases but you can only access 38% of the cases that, that has ever happened have ever happened. One of the other problems with early phase research is it's really difficult to extrapolate data from one population to another, particularly if you're extrapolating data from a mouse to a human. So can you imagine how difficult that is? Um, with a lot of the animal studies, so it's known that the, the animal studies, the designs are quite flawed. So it could be something as simple as trying to put the data from a mouse onto a middle-aged, sort of morbidly obese male uh, with multiple comorbidities and you've sort of taken data from a group of very healthy mice. So these things all throw up different types of problems for researchers, um, particularly with the lack of published outcomes. So it's very difficult to actually work out what the actual risks and benefits will be. 
Obviously, the way that you convey information about risks and benefits is very important to patients and participants. So if you're not able to gauge an accurate account, it's very difficult for them to as well. Uh, we have lots of systems in place um, within the, uh, the formal research setting, and these include things like ethics review systems and also scientific assessment. So typically, those types of committees will, will look at um, the information that's been presented by the researcher, and we'll see if it seems to be a really accurate account of the risks and benefits. Um, but sometimes things can go wrong, and this is one example. So in the European summer of 2002, researchers in France began a study, um, and it was a new experimental gene transfer. So they were approaching parents of newborn infants. So the infants were aged six days old. Uh, they had been diagnosed at birth with a, a gene deficiency, and it's called EXID. Um, in this case, the researchers were going to try and transplant the gene into these infants. But to do that, you needed a carrier. So you can't just sort of inject genes and cells into an infant without something to, to help that gene get taken up by a human. So what types of things are we really good at catching as humans? Viruses, Viruses that's right. How many of you here have a cold today? I know one of you does, but they're not putting up their hand. <laughs> OK, <laughs> sorry, I'm not going to look at you now. Anyway, so you typically use viruses to transport these genes into humans. And in this case, they were using a virus. It was called the Maloney leukaemia virus. Um, so for the treatment for these children, typically, uh, if the child was given a matched bone marrow transplant, so that's where they're having an autologist, we're all talking about all these scientific words today, um, they normally have a success rate for cure of greater than 90%. Um, if it's unmatched, so it's coming from another source other than themselves, um, the typical cure rate was around 60 to 80%. Um, with both of these types of bone marrow transplants, you would no also need to have a quite a uh, severe chemotherapy regime as well. The other option for these parents, and so normally these children would die if they were left untreated, horrible death, and they would die at age two. The other option for parents was palliative care. So if they decided not to go ahead with bone marrow transplants, they could use palliative care, and that's aimed at minimising symptoms, etc. Uh, so for this study, nine sets of parents were approached. So remember, the infants are six days old, and they were asked to take part in this study. Um, for these parents, they actually thought there would be some benefit. So they chose to forego the bone marrow transplantations, uh, and instead they received uh, the gene transfer. So by winter of 2005, three of the children that had received the transfer had contracted leukaemia. Um, one child actually died from leukaemia, and then another two later developed leukaemia as well. Um, now, one of the problems here was that when the researchers were undertaking the analysis of risk and benefit, um, this type of research was very, very new. So they were only speculating around what the risks and benefits were. And what they thought was that the risk of cancer developing, so here they were going to develop leukaemia. Where did the leukaemia come from? That's right, so it was the Maloney leukaemia virus. So they actually thought it was speculative and theoretical. Now, that's not because they had evidence that it wasn't going to happen. It was because there was just a lack of evidence. It really hadn't been done a lot before. There had been a few studies done, and in one study uh, involved 80 adult participants, and none of the adult participants had um, contracted cancer. And that information was actually included in the information and consent form that the parents signed. What they, what they failed to say in that... Um, applicate in that form though, was that all 80 of the adult participants had died within 30 months. Because of course these types of studies, they're already terminally ill. Um, so one of the, the Salk Institute, which does a lot of this work, actually said that um, because they thought that the children would not live long enough to actually develop cancer. So it was based on a flawed hypothesis. So this is just one example of some of the things that co can go wrong with this type of research. I do want to point out, though, that these are the exceptions. They are not the rule. So we don't want you leaving here today, um, particularly with, with, you know, after what Alison said and then what I've said, thinking that, you know, there are crazy people out there doing stem cell therapies all over Australia um, and all this type of early phase research, and it's very dangerous. Um, so these are definitely the exceptions. If you're looking at legal cases... So typically there's been a focus on things like invalid consent. So you can imagine the parents of a six-day-old infant being given information, the, the chance of something happening 
uh, that's bad for the child is sort of equated back to what had happened to those adults. But there was some missing information there. Um, and it could be something like uh, there was a recent case in, uh, with a dentist in New South Wales. I think, Bill, you had this on your WordPress, um, where a fellow, a, a person wasn't told that the procedure they had agreed to was actually non-beneficial. So here we've got a lot of uh, people coming forward and saying, look, I didn't realise that what I'd agreed to was not going to benefit me and it wasn't therapeutic. So there you look at issues around consent. Um, the other things to think about are things like negligence, and that includes, so in Australia, that might be uh, a failure to warn. Obviously, you'd have to pass the two-limb test. It could be fraud. So we do know that researchers uh, in the past have withheld information that would be considered very significant for a patient to know uh, before they agreed to take part. It could be something like product liability, and that extends to um, drugs, devices, etc. Uh, with research malpractice, and I'm speaking here... I know the University of Queensland has been in the newspaper a bit recently, so we've had some members of our staff uh, that have been embroiled in different research malpractice um, issues, one might say. Um, so this could be something as simple as withholding information and presenting a different, different projection of risk than it should be, or it could be uh, something along the lines of falsifying data, um, which is often as simple as just changing some numbers on an Excel spreadsheet. It could be other things like um, breach of contract has been brought up in the US as well as privacy violations. And certainly at the moment there's some big cases involving the use of children in non-therapeutic research. So if you have a case, um, if so if someone does come to see you and they have been involved in research and they think they have been harmed in some way, the best thing is to find an expert first. Uh, so not all researchers are medical practitioners and not all medical practitioners are researchers. So it's important to look at the type of study that they've been involved in. Um, some of the things that you would look at from a beginning, so you would, would not start with the presumption that the patient or the participant has been told um, and given an accurate account of what would happen. So you would look at the way that the study is designed. This includes things like the systematic literature review. So I know in law you do uh, a lot of legal reviews, Boolean phrases, all those types of things. It's very similar for research. Uh, the gold standard of evidence is a systematic literature review. And really, before you do this type of research, you should be doing systematic literature reviews and then working out an analysis of risk and benefit. So when these types of things aren't done well, and often they're given to a junior staff member, so it might be someone doing an honours degree or it could be someone doing a PhD, um, they're likely to miss some very important literature. Uh, and that could be the literature that includes a lot of risk for you. If you're looking at extrapolation of data from other studies, so remember uh, animal studies are studies on animals. So extrapolating that data to a human population can be quite difficult. Uh, you'd also look at things like the consent process. What was the participant told? You'd have a look at the consent forms and you'd completely interrogate those. Um, you would look at things like the conduct of the researchers and clinicians before, during and after the study. And you'd look at even things like the nuts and bolts approach, which is looking at how specimens are stored, how are drugs stored, you know, is it all according to regulation. <coughs> Some things like monitoring and reporting of adverse events. What we have in Australia at the moment in, a, in clinical research is if there is an adverse event, you do have to report it to an ethics committee. And normally you'd have to report it within a hospital as well. However, typically it's left for the clinician to decide whether they think that that adverse event is related to a clinical research study. So you really don't have that independent review of um, the adverse event. So that's something else to consider. <coughs> and that was me with a cold too, so hopefully you won't get my virus. Just before I finish, um, so I do work for the NHMRC as well, and they've asked me to put this in. If you are interested in knowing more about research and having a look at what is available out there, um, no, I don't want you to think that you can pick up potential clients in the future by trawling through the database. Uh, but you can click on this website and you can type in something like stem cells and we'll actually tell you all the different types of studies that are happening in the moment in Australia. So for participants, they can actually log on here and find out information about how to get enrolled in a study. And I will point out that um, in Australia, the people with uh, illness and disease would like to be involved in research. So for us, it's really important to make sure that research continues uh, because that's what the patients would like. And I'll just hand back to Mike then because we do want to finish on a happy note. I'm not sure if this is, I guess we'll see when I try to go forward if this is um, the next slide set. Um, 
Do you know if there should be uh, the last half of the previous presentation? I've lost control. It's probably a good thing. If I could remember what it said on the first slide, I could tell you now. So uh, one thing I do remember because that, that pie chart came up Oh, here we are. So that uh, we'll go to it then. Uh, the future of stem cell therapies. Actually, I think the future is very bright. I mean, we're we're lucky that we live in such an incredible time. You know, it's um, um, and what I wanted to suggest is that perhaps the past actually points to the future. So uh, I, I like this figure. This is from a, a 2012 paper uh, from Daily. Daily is a um, actually pointing the laser at that screen. I don't know why I thought that would work. Um, geez, can I just have another drink here? Um, so, uh, in the past, uh, in, this is 2012, the majority of the clinical trial therapies were uh, hematopoietic stem cell based. And uh, as I told you, uh, hematopoietic stem cells are the only routinely used stem cell in the clinic. And, and so we're working uh, as a community on improving uh, bone marrow transplants um, you know, to treat leukemia uh, patients or uh, people that maybe have an immune uh, deficiency like the SCID deficiency um, that we just learned about. Um, but it, but it, goes, it goes beyond that. And uh, what I wanted to show you uh, was, um, was this. Ebony forwarded this to me on the weekend uh, as we were talking about this uh, talk coming up. And th this is from, obviously, The Guardian. And uh, this group is talking about another hematopoietic stem cell-based therapy, and it's actually also a spin-off of the SCID concept. Uh, what they've done here is they, they've went and they've uh, genetically modified, no doubt using a virus. They've modified uh, patients' hematopoietic stem cells outside of the body. And then uh, they're returning them into the body and with the objective of those cells being trained then, genetically trained to target the cancer growing in the patient. And these immune-based therapy trials uh, using hematopoietic stem cells probably are increasingly making up a large portion of this pie chart. Uh, the other thing I wanted to point out on this pie chart, and I won't point at that, uh, is that the MSC 115 there uh, that was, I think that uh, when we were having our introduction, I think that the 200 stem cell uh, trials was actually referring to the number of MSC trials. So this is also what Allison was talking about, was mostly MSC-based trials. But since 2012, on the same uh, clinicaltrials.gov, the website where these legitimate trials, if you like, are registered, that, that number has grown to about... Uh, 450. So it tells you how in about three years the number of legitimate trials is increasing extremely rapidly. So, uh, and I, I think that that does give us all hope. Um, the other thing I wanted to suggest, sorry to be inconsistent like this, the other thing I wanted to suggest is uh, even though we talked critically about cartilage defect repair, I do think cartilage defect repair uh, is in the near term uh, a realistic goal for stem cell based therapies. And I, I think that actually uh, the mobility and the wealth of uh, the aging population uh, will be a big driver in this. People want, people want to be able to be able to walk around comfortably, and I think that they will look to power the development and the innovation in this area. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to point out is that I think stem cell biology and stem cell research in general will help us identify new factors that just allow us to uh, promote healing in general. And a really interesting thing is the therapies that Allison was talking about, in my opinion, probably don't work the way you think they do, if they work at all. Um, so classically, uh, MSCs were thought uh, to differentiate or turn into new tissue. And this is a, this is a figure out of a fellow named Kaplan's paper. This was published in 2011. Now Kaplan uh, in the 90s 
is the fellow credited with giving mesocomal stem cells their name. He named them. He didn't discover them, but he sort of put all the literature together and he named them mesocomal stem cells. And in 2011, he changed their name again. Uh, and this time he decided there were mesocomal stromal cells. And he decided that for the most part, they probably weren't working the way he and other people thought. So we used to think that they were turning into new tissue, that they were a mesodermal or connective tissue precursor, and they could turn into more cartilage, they could turn into more bone, they could do something like that. But in his paper in 2011, he described them as secreting factors which encourage tissue regeneration. So the really exciting thing about this is if it is a secreted factor, we maybe don't need the cells at all, right? If we can identify that some trophic factor is critical, we can get rid of the cells and we can make a stem cell pill, you know? So as a community, our research is, is important and it may not play out exactly as we think it will, but I, I'm certain that it will change medicine. Okay, and I just I wanted to thank my group and I wanted to thank Slater and Gordon again for the opportunity. Thank you.